as we see um, in that film, and as we see now in our lives, first responders, emergency workers, and veterans have some of the highest rates of suicide and post-traumatic stress. And hopefully now, after we've seen in this film, we can see a lot more of that coming out into our research into the mainstream medicine. So I will be introducing our panelists. I'm gonna call them up one by one, and they're gonna give a bit of their story, and then we'll do open up to a Q&A. So first, I'd like to call up Debbie O'Neill. She's a firefighter uh, with the City of Toronto for 10 years and is now experienced, um, sorry, Debbie experienced in 2015 a health crisis by way of autoimmune disease and PTSD, catapulting her out of a career she loved and into an unknown world of darkness and uncertainty. Debbie has since followed a new calling in the healing arts, the great reverence for plant medicines, psychedelic psychotherapy. She will share how ayahuasca benefited her healing as a first responder, and how she sees it helping others. And here's Debbie. So that movie was awesome. That took me back to an ayahuasca ceremony for sure. <laughs> um, so like Jake mentioned, I'm a firefighter. I'm not a public speaker. So I apologize. I'm going to be reading from my notes. But it kind of entails everything that I just kind of wanted to talk about tonight and get across. You know, when I was asked to do this um, talk, I had a hard time contemplating what to say because uh, uh, ayahuasca is quite the ineffable experience, right? It, um, it's really hard to put into words. And I, I really like uh, Matt, Matt, who's coming up next. He said to me, what did you say? How to describe the sound of the color... Smell the color nine. Smell the color nine. I'm sorry, did I steal your thunder on that one? But I loved it. I was like, yeah, that's great. But anyway, so here we go. So I first, start, first started on this journey in 2015. And it actually started years before that, but it was in 2015 that the universe really actually kicked my ass. I'd been a firefighter for the city of Toronto for nine years at that point. I was a single mom to a beautiful five-year-old son, and I have, having left a toxic marriage. I was experiencing major Crohn's flare that left me hospitalized and unable to work. Once I was back home and still unable to work, the major symptoms of PTSD started appearing. Looking back, they appeared years before, but I had just managed them. I thought they were just part of my personality or a result of the job, um, not really tying them to PTSD. I had always struggled with things like emotion regulation, uh, codependent relationships, addictions, and an adrenaline-filled attitude that really did not take any regard of my own life into consideration. I had anxiety that left me shaking constantly and unable to leave the house. I couldn't sleep at night because of the nightmares and this crushing feeling on my chest. It left me breathless and woke me from my sleep, struggling for air. I had highly intrusive thoughts of a particular hanging that I attended. That lent itself to thoughts of hanging myself. And since I lived on a property that was surrounded by forest, all that I could actually see were hanging bodies from the trees. I remember that I would run calls of suicide attempts where the patient would say things such as, I just couldn't control myself, or I didn't feel safe with myself. I never understood what that meant. It didn't make any sense to me, and I didn't know how that was even possible until I reached this point in my life. I couldn't go anywhere that sparked a feeling of anxiety of being trapped. That included the gym, the mall, the grocery store, and basically everywhere. I essentially couldn't make it to the, till noon to, without a drink to get through the day. So I credit Gabor Mate, and I don't know if anyone's familiar with Gabor Mate, but I credit Gabor with uh, saving my life, or at least pointing me in the direction to save my own life. I was already quite familiar with his work, and it really resonated with me. If you're unfamiliar with Gabor, he speaks about things such as addiction is a response to pain. If you address your addiction, you, or sorry, if you address, you address an addiction by addressing the pain. All pain is rooted in trauma, in particular childhood trauma, which creates a dysfunctional neural patterning. He also speaks about trauma results in a disconnection from self. Essentially, it is this disconnection that causes pain. The larger and more pervasive the trauma, the greater the pain, and subsequently, the further from yourself you become. 
So since he was the only person saying things that deeply resonated with me, I did the only logical thing and I started stalking him. <laughs> every time he came to Toronto, I attended all his workshops and I took every opportunity to talk to him. One thing that he told me that always stuck with me was that childhood trauma does not create PTSD. However, for everyone who has PTSD, there's a history of childhood trauma. He said that you could send numerous soldiers to war who undergo the same exact experiences, and the ones who develop PTSD when they return would always have a childhood trauma history. That's when the connection was made in my head, that it wasn't necessarily the calls that I ran, it was my unresolved childhood history that was keeping the calls alive. Gabor also told me that I would never work through my complex PTSD without psychedelics. I thought at the time that this was a pretty bold statement, but looking back, he was absolutely correct. Complex PTSD is no longer a diagnosis, so they have changed it to borderline personality. Interesting little fact. I started with ketamine, which was a good introduction to working with psychedelics. There were plenty of visuals during the acute phase of the drug that I could garner personal messages from, and it was quite enjoyable. But what really benefited me the most was that for weeks afterwards, I got a little space between myself and my emotions. It gave me a little reprieve from the onslaught of overwhelming feelings. It allowed me to become more of an observer towards my emotions, which enabled me to catch my breath a little, and also to learn to work with them by sitting with the discomfort. My stocking finally paid off. <laughs> Gabor sent me to Nelson, BC to work with some colleagues of his and, and happened to be amazing healers. I stayed with them in their home and over the course of the week, we worked with three MMC, MDMA, and DMT. Each experience was unique and provided me with a different piece to this unraveling puzzle. Three MMC and MDMA were very lucid experiences and worked in conjunction with each other. 3MMC introduced me to my repressed self in a very tactile way. Taught me that my body had its own intelligence that didn't originate in my mind. This was completely foreign to me. I had the experience of giving my repressed self a voice and a physical structure. She had the opportunity to be heard and seen in a way they had never experienced. She had an identity and a presence by the end of the session. And I was left with an inherent understanding of what it felt like to listen to myself and honor myself. My MDMA experience gave me the gift of what love should be, what it should feel like and actually feel like. I was sexually violated from the time I was seven years old and always by those who I was supposed to trust and care for, so family members, neighbor, friend, coworker. So what happens when you're sexualized at such a young age is that the feeling of love gets coupled with pain. You learn that love is painful. And that just becomes your normal. You unconsciously search for it going from one dysfunctional or abusive situation to another. MDMA allowed me to feel what pure love felt like and into my cells and the very essence of my being. It was a clear message of this is how you love yourself and receive love and give love. It was something that was completely foreign to me without compromising my soul. No needing to pleasure somebody else that wasn't love or fill the void for another. Just pure love without barriers. It was phenomenal. MDMA also gave me laser beam focus into the predator victim dynamic that I repeatedly kept attracting to myself. I could easily pick out situations in which I was playing a victim role and perpetuating a control imbalance situation. MDNA, MDMA was interesting too because it also allowed me to visit all my calls. It was like standing on top of a Grand Canyon overlooking all my calls that just rolled like waves in an ocean. It was so clear that there were only like a few that I need to address and, and work through. But, and it was, uh, it was phenomenal. <laughs> DMT, DMT experience was one of the most profound moments of my life. 
It blew the doors off the physical realm and clarified my existence and belief system in a matter of 45 minutes. The underpinnings of the experience was the knowledge that we collectively are bundles of interconnected energy in physical bodies. Once you tear away your personal conceptions and defense mechanisms and stories that go along with our own individual neuroses, we're all the same. We're simply bundles of love that flow through and into one another without barriers. So I continued with the same healers on two more occasions. I went to ayahuasca ceremonies and retreats in the next year. Each retreat consisted of two ceremonies over the course of a week with full days of integration in between. Ayahuasca, which is referred as grandmother in shamanic practices, became a teacher for me. I've developed a relationship of sorts with the plant. She taught me how to use my resources instead of seeking outside of myself, which, as Gabor says, is the root of addictive behavior. It's very difficult to harness or articulate all the ways that this plant medicine has changed my life because the biggest changes are held within those quiet moments and within myself. I can say it's in the way that I now see the effects of my words before I even say them. It's in my ability to reframe things in my mind before the story in my head takes a life of its own. It's in the peace that I feel when I'm quiet. No buzzing or impulse to busy myself. And I recognize that if that impulse comes, I know that I'm avoiding something that needs to be looked at. It's my ability to look at my husband and know that he loves me, not for what I can do for him. I can now just feel that without the anxiety of needing to please or pleasure, the gift of letting love in is beyond words. It's in my ability to be comfortable enough to sit with my emotions. Still not easy, but now I know how to work with it. It's in these moments that when I'm in the middle of an argument or some negative mental derailment that a new perspective just comes in out of nowhere and completely shifts my entire outlook on the situation. Stops me in my tracks. That never happened before ayahuasca. Now on the flip side, I also pay, feel pain more fully, whether it be my kids or my husband or globally with what's happening around the world. I truly see how we're all in this together and what happens in one part happens in the whole. There is no separation or borders. Those are just superficial constructs. I did not understand this before. I understood me and my little world that was separate from everybody else. Now, how, all, how did all of this occur in just a few ceremonies? It's probably something that the doctor will be more effectively speaking to than I can. I, mean, I don't understand much about the neurobiology of it. But I have garnered a few themes that can perhaps lend to the therapeutic discussion. My first few ceremonies were very difficult. I always liken it to walking through the forest of terror where you get to feel every dark feeling that ever existed with an intensity that seems almost unbearable. Plus all the purging and shaking and crying and all that shit. <laughs> but what was pivotal for me was that once I developed my own fortitude and learned how to work with the medicine and realized that that forest of terror that I was experiencing was really just a version of what I was doing to myself. That's when things shifted. I have four themes from my experience and I'll be quick. I wanted to share with you. And they overlap and flow into one another. The first one is black and white thinking. One of the byproducts of having a history of trauma is the inability to see the shades of gray. For me, you either loved someone or you hated them, but never at the same time. Things were right or they were wrong, but never at the same time. <laughs> I was either a good person or a bad person, but again, never at the same time. This made disagreements particularly difficult. 
This mentality crept into a more significant problem for me. I could not recognize more than one feeling at once. Grandmother gave me the ability to feel an array of emotions at the same time. She showed me this through the, the fact that even though I was crying and shaking and terrified, I also felt peaceful and loved and held. Second theme that I uh, have garnered from all these experiences are pain and pleasure are intricately woven, but not coupled. I was shown how to feel pleasure and pain separately. However, that you cannot escape pain and just look for the pleasure. I always understood this conceptually, but grandmother brought that into my somatic awareness. Going through the dark force of terror and its pain was also building resilience and a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction, a way of returning to a state of wholeness for myself. Pleasure is obtained through work and sometimes pain. I didn't understand that concept. In order to see the beautiful vista, you have to endure the struggle of climbing the mountain. I always avoid the mountain, but I still want the beautiful vista. This is a concept that I desperately needed to overcome addictions. And it also helped me reframe the challenging situations from why is this happening to me? What did I do? Why me? Why me? To what is this showing me? What am I getting out of this? Third theme. This one was kind of interesting. I don't need to grasp for resources out myself, outside of myself. Everything I need is within me. I never realized how much I was doing this, nor could I recognize when I was doing it. Grandmother again showed me this in a very tactile way. I was very thankful that my first few experiences were with a group that had a background in somatic work and understood the value of touch to heal developmental wounds. They were there to hold me or just let me hang on to them. When I was going through that dark forest, I had this indescribable feeling of needing something or someone. It was an, almost an insatiable feeling of grasping. I couldn't, I couldn't get enough. And if they left me, I, I thought for sure I was going to die on my own. I would physically grab them and rub them for reassurance, and I couldn't stop myself, even though I was thinking, my God, I'm going to rub this woman's skin off her arm. <laughs> and that was during the fourth ceremony. We're in the midst of shaking and crying and beating them up that I felt a warm rush come over me, followed by an inner peacefulness. I was still crying and shaking, but I sat up out of this hunched over position that I had spent, fuck, three, ses three ceremonies in, so good 20 hours. <laughs> and the insatiable need to have someone there was gone. My helpers provide comfort, but that desperate grasping feeling was gone. I was able to use my own resources. So lastly, the fourth theme, healthy sense of connection to myself, to others, to the world, to my sense of purpose. These experiences less me to, less led me to my last point that grandmother is currently working on teaching me. One of my most pervasive symptoms was a daily anxiety that felt as though there was a vice grip on my chest, waking me up in the middle of the night, gasping for air under the crushing weight on my chest. Grandmother showed me that these things were rooted in a disconnection from myself. I was so used to suppressing my, myself that I had lost the ability to even hear or have any connect or hear myself what I was thinking or doing or my intuition. And it was manifesting in my biology and my symptomology. Herein lies my work as it continues today. To continue to check in with myself and ask the question, are my thoughts and actions congruent with who I am? I now understand that when I start experiencing little whispers of these symptoms, I am not in alignment. So as the video had mentioned, psychedelics is a, has been an invaluable tool over other types of therapies that it could not match. But at the end of the day, however, that's what it is, a tool. The work still needs to be done. Daily practices need to be maintained, and I still need to watch my thoughts and take care of my body. 
But at the end of the day, psychedelics have given me a life that I could not have gotten otherwise. And that's my story. Wow, thank you very much for sharing that, Debbie. We're gonna get uh, Matthew up here next. I have a bit of an introduction. <clears throat> we have Matt Chorney here. We spent over a decade as a police constable with the OPP. After years of responding to traumatic emergencies, he began to experience symptoms of PTSD. After finding conventional treatments unable to resolve his suffering, he discovered an ayahuasca retreat in South America. Matt is now an advocate for first responders who struggle with mental health issues. He will share his experiences and how he feels ayahuasca helped him with his healing. And thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming out. I didn't really prepare too much. Um, this documentary really, really hit, uh, really hit me hard, brought me back to a few things. I started off, my father was a, a police officer in Toronto, and I grew up in Mississauga. Um, my mother and father, no, no complaints, everything was fine. Growing up, I thought I had a normal childhood. And a lot of it was, I was told how to live a life. I was told what was important. Um, get a job, be successful, get a career, um, all those things. And I strive to, to achieve that. And in 2003, I got hired with the OPP and, and started my journey with them. In 2004, I was exposed to my first major trauma uh, incident. And I had no idea how to deal with, with any of that, nothing that life had prepared me for was able to prepare me for, for what I would see and, and all the uh, subsequent tragedies. And I soon realized that um, in that culture, in the police culture, going through training, uh, it's very ego-driven. Uh, you will succeed, uh, win, win, win. And they would, they would, in essence, weed out the weak. Uh, there was people that broke during academy training and, and they went off to do their own thing and, and uh, lived a, a different life. And, kind of envy them now. Uh, looking at it, I sacrificed a lot of myself to be able to function in that environment and to achieve the, uh, the goal. And throughout my career, I'd moved from very rural areas. Um, people who are from Toronto know the OPP are not just running the highways. We do every other community that doesn't have a municipal force, so we don't just run the highways issuing tickets to people. I've actually never worked on a 400 series highway. <laughs> Um, but what I did do was worked in a lot of small towns, northern communities. I was in Blind River for five years, which is near Elliott Lake, and in between Sudbury, Sioux, St. Marie. And when you're up there, there's no one else. When there's a call, you don't have specialized units to deal with things. You are, you're it. And I do remember numerous times having my, working by myself and having backup at least 30 minutes away and I had to find a way to deal with that and function. And we would deal with things from start to finish, from a call, we would deal with everything, and I won't get into details, but the entire process, dealing with the families, everything. And I was really good at training myself not to feel, because I didn't know how to react. So in an emotional situation, I had to be the strong person for people, uh, be that rock, and I, I just pushed my own uh, emotions to the side, and that's what I got used to dealing with. I, was, I actually became very numb to everything. And when you numb the tragedy and all that stuff, I numbed the good as well. I wasn't able to feel anything. And in 2014, I, my daughter was born. And we had midwives, and I actually delivered my daughter. And to watch her come out, I didn't feel very much. I was happy, uh, but I was robbed of being able to be vulnerable and feel all those emotions. And then things started slowly going downhill with, um, with my symptoms. I ran from everything. I would move detachments and I became an instructor for the last three years uh, with the OPP and just try to get away from everything and you can run as much as you want. But it's, it was still there and then I was placed on medication and in the end um, I went to a very dark place. I find people in emergency services who have PTSD, we refer to it as the dark place. It's like Fight Club. First rule is you don't talk about it. But if anyone knows what the dark place is, it's not a good place. I credit my daughter for saving my life. She's the only reason 
why I never really went into that dark place 100%. She kept me around long enough to the point where I was just desperate to find a way to get through all of this shit. It was consuming my life, my relationships, dissolving, avoiding my parents, who I love very much, my friends, everyone just, just don't want to be around them anymore. I don't know how to. And I'm tired of walking into a place and being, hey, this is Matt, he's a cop. That's not who I am. That was a job. And no, sorry, I can't help you with the speeding ticket you got from so-and-so. Like, it's just, it, it was, after a while, I was just like, how do I live a normal life? How do I be normal? And I ended up searching alternative medicines. Again, I was trained that plant medicines were dangerous and bad and illegal. And I always stuck to my guns when I said I've never gone to a place where anybody had ever caused any problems who smoked a joint, not once. Yet alcohol was legal and I couldn't understand it. I watched a few videos and came across ayahuasca. And I actually watched a video which blew my mind today because I believe it was the exact same clip from this movie in 2000. I, I've watched this in 2017. I saw a clip where a guy talked about his heart and that it didn't heal it, but it had stitches. And I just saw that again today, and I was just like, holy, that's amazing. And I talked to my therapist about it. She was supportive, and off I went to Peru um, to do ayahuasca. And the intentions are very important, because what you want to work on is what it, it did for me. And my first thing was flashbacks. I need to get rid of the flashbacks. And I need to feel. I need to feel love. I just need to feel again. And I got more than I bargained for. And in instant moments, things changed. And I don't know how, but things changed with the flashbacks. I accepted the guilt that I wasn't able to save somebody or help somebody more than I could. All of that was forgiven by myself. And after that, I was able to start rebuilding my relationships with people. But there was still a, an anger inside, a deep-rooted anger. I was angry at the world. Like you say, you say somebody cuts you off, you're angry at them. Why would I be angry? I'm angry at all sorts of stuff. So I said, okay, um, I don't know what else to do. I'm going back to Peru. And I went back and I said, this is it. I need to find out where that anger is. And I went back and I found it deep rooted in myself. And I was angry at myself and that was projected to everyone else around me. I also learned that my life, I've been fulfilling uh, my goals and dreams to appease my parents. I was trying to make them happy because as a child I learned that I got praised for doing good things and if I made people happy then I made I was happy but I was making them happy and feeding off of that but I wasn't making myself happy so I realized I was trying to just appease people um, sacrifice my own self for that and and in the end I had the most powerful visions of my daughter and how to rebuild that relationship um, things that I could do and when I came back, my connection with her has never been so strong. Every time I see it, it doesn't matter what day like what I'm having, I just look at that, that life, that love, and I feel it again. And it just teaches or taught me that, you know what, everything can be going on. Life is like waves. We got good waves, we got bad waves. There's always going to be waves. And it's how you look at it. Every problem that we have is made up in our own mind. In my mind, I made problems. And I started seeing the simplicity of it and realized that there's so many things that complicate our life. There's so many distractions and it's all right in front of us. The answer is right in front of us. It's so simple. It's that smile we see in a friend. It's the smile we see in a family member, somebody we love, just that connection. You can't buy that. You can't get likes for that. You can't do any of that. You can't post it anywhere. That's organic and that's true. And that's where I realized that's, 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 where, it's, that's where the healing is is coming from within here. And to be vulnerable, to show people, again, I, I was in a job, I couldn't show emotion. And, and, and again, you were always right, you know, blah, 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 it's the law. No, sometimes I'm wrong and I gotta sit back and realize that and just listen to people and be okay with being wrong and being okay with crying and being okay with, with edit, whatever emotion is, not to be afraid. And I thank, I thank Ayahuasca for showing me that and integration has been so important because you can go away, you can do ayahuasca, you can do any uh, magic mushrooms, MDMA, all these things are very effective. However, we still have a life to live. And it's those lessons that I've been taught in ayahuasca that I need to live every single day of my life. And that's why I came forward 
to speak for emergency services, um, people that, that can't, because I know what'll happen. Um, you stand up and say you're doing these things, I, I have a pretty good idea, um, at least in my own experience, how easy it is to be outcast and, and this not good for anyone's mental health. But in the end, I've also seen enough tragedies with officers and regular people. And for me, enough was enough. And that's why um, I'm here. Hopefully, I can answer some questions or help some people just to, to either help themselves or maybe pass a message to somebody else that you can kid yourself and do everything you want to get promoted and do all these things that you think are going to make you happy when it's so easy that it's already right in front of you. So I welcome any questions and thank you guys very much. So Dr. Brian Rush has worked for over 38 years as a mental health and substance use research scientist with the Center for Addictions and Mental Health in Toronto. In 2013, retired to focus on his consulting practice. He, return, he retains the position of scientist emeritus at CAMH, as well as his position as full professor at the University of Toronto in both the departments of psychiatry and public health sciences. He will share now, <clears throat> he will share how he was introduced to ayahuasca and psychedelic medicines, as well as how he sees them fitting into addictions and mental health treatments. Everybody, Dr. Brian Rush. Thank you. So I want to start with a kind of a simple question, why this film's not in the film festival? Can you put a film in after it's been released? I don't know. It was really outstanding. So uh, kudos to the people who made that and uh, kudos to the people who participated in it and kind of showed themselves to everyone. And thank you to the people who've um, brought it here to, to share with us. And thank you for coming. And thank you, Debbie and Matt. Um, Sarah, who's at the front here, works with me in the, uh, as a student, but I'm learning a lot from her, probably more than she's got from me already. And um, she said that the purpose here, by the way, it looks a bit like an AA group. <laughs> but, but that's the circles completed, so we're all in it, I guess. Um, that uh, the purpose of this was to kind of facilitate some kind of transition from such a powerful emotional experience back to our everyday life that's outside this theater. And I want you to kind of hold on to that because it's important to transition and, and, and part of that is thinking about what we've seen and thinking about what we're sharing in these stories, but, but keep that in mind for yourselves as you kind of transition out. And also keep in mind that for those of us that have had some experiences similar to the people who helped make this, this documentary, that it's a pretty powerful impact. There's a lot going on right now for myself included and for others including the people who spoke, but I'm sure others in the audience. So I just want you to be aware of that and kind of walk and talk um, gently. So I prepared a bit of a presentation. I'm, I'm here, Dr. Rush, whatever. And um, there's kind of two ways this could go. One is to kind of share personal stories, um, which I'm happy to do, but Maybe that comes up in the Q&A because maybe facilitating this transition um, just presents some information kind of maybe in a little less emotional way that might help everybody release a little bit <clears throat> so it's not quite so heavy. And then we'll see how it ends up because we might end up all back in the same space anyway. I have a feeling we might, might not. So anyway, kind of in the interest of uh, alleviating a little bit of that, and I think that's partly why I was asked to come, not sharing only personal experiences, but to kind of bring a bit of an academic perspective to this, and also uh, a bit of vision, like where all this is kind of heading. And, and it's not quite clear where it's heading. Um, so without giving the whole presentation away, I just say it's a little bit, <laughs> it's not a lecture, but it might look that way with the presentation. So I put as many slides with pictures as I could. Um, so I'm probably sitting right in the middle of it, I'm not sure. You 
can see pretty well, or is that okay? And I guess that light probably can't, well, that's the projector, so. Yeah, thanks. These guys are great, by the way. We should give a round of applause. For these and I hope we don't fall off the bloody stage. Paramedics in the room. Paramedics in the room. Um, yeah, the film was pretty good about showing uh, one side of the ayahuasca story in terms of its production and et cetera, but it, there's, a, there's a part of it that it didn't show. It showed this part, the main ingredients. The ayahuasca produced in the Amazon, grows in the Amazon, the Amazonian basin. And uh, there are different uh, combinations of these ingredients, so it's most common with these two plants, the ayahuasca vine itself and chacruna, which provides the psychedelic aspects to it. But just as a point of information, there are other combinations. And for those of you who have been or intend to go or participate, you never quite know exactly. And it's important to know or ask some questions where it's made and who's made it. And, and if you if you're really get into it, become well informed as to what you're actually drinking. Um, so th this is kind of the norm. It also tastes like shit. And, and uh, it's interesting how ayahuasca has kind of crept its way into the popular media and film and so on. And I remember, what was that movie about the Ark? And, uh, um, sorry? No, the, the one where it's, the the ark and the, their, he gets the vision to save all the animals. It was it was about the lost ark, right? Noah's ark, like the film called Noah. And and uh, Anthony Perkins, is that was his name. Russell Crowe, Crow, that's right. He's he's uh, drinking this medicine. And he says, he says, all good medicine tastes bad. <laughs> so <laughs> there was actually some truth in that. Um, but anyway, so let's go on to the next slide. This is the shamanic con uh, context, similar, roughly similar to what you saw. It's not always day, evening, etc., and it's not always uh, twice a day is pretty heavy going, actually. But I noticed there wasn't that much in the cup. Um, but who knows? It was pretty powerful still, I think. So you may be familiar with this. This is kind of the uh, common version that's portrayed in uh, media and most film, but there's another kind of version of this. You want to go to the next one, please? Oh, and this is kind of, the, this is kind of a typical cookhouse, and it does take a long time to make. And by the way, there is an environmental aspect to this that's not talked about too much yet in the general public, and that is about the general availability of the ayahuasca vine, and people traveling. Uh, there's so many centers now in the Amazonian basin, including several countries, that people are traveling quite long distances now to uh, procure. Um, but the other context is the next slide, which are the uh, what they call the syncretic churches, which started in Brazil. Uh, I'll give you a big history lesson here, but it's related to the, to the rubber um, boom, quote unquote, in the uh, Acre area in, the, in, in Brazil and uh, the rubber workers, many of whom were um, black with a history in their family of slavery, um, were first encountered the indigenous people in uh, that area and drank ayahuasca. And one of those individuals had his own vision of, of creating a church, and it's called the syncretic church because it introduced a lot of Afro-Brazilian religion, African religion, Christianity, and the indigenous religions, it's all kind of a mixture. And ayahuasca is considered a sacrament. Uh, in Brazil, there are three of these churches, uh, Vegetal, uh, Santo Daime, and Barquinha. Barquinha is interesting because it means little boat. And uh, so whenever somebody had a new idea or a new vision to branch off, they, they created another uh, church. And I like the Barquinha because it's like, this little boat branched off from that church and floated off and did its own thing. Um, so each of those churches are a little bit different, but as you probably know, uh, they are now um, part of, uh, they've been globalized. And here in Canada, we now have four of these, of the Santa Daime churches that have legalized 
permits for the importation of ayahuasca. They're important uh, for people who study religion and, and uh, anthropology, et cetera, et cetera. They're hugely important, but they're important uh, for research because they've provided uh, a legal means of studying uh, the effects of ayahuasca. And in, in Brazil in particular, there's people who've drank ayahuasca regularly for 20, 30 years and they've participated in a lot of research that I can tell you a little bit about. So this is um, a ceremony. They tend to stand. In Barquinha, they sit uh, around the kitchen table and you sit for like five or six hours singing hymns. It's kind of interesting experience. Um, but the next slide, I think, just shows a little bit of the difference. This looks like a maple syrup cookhouse. Um, it's cooked in huge volumes. It's also a little bit thinner. Uh, not quite as potent as the uh, traditional Amazonian medicine. And, uh, but anyway, it shows, the, again, the volumes. Most of the churches, and I visited some, they, they have their own um, quote-unquote plantations. They're kind of growing their own, so they're not marching off into the jungle and, and procuring. But it's important to know that it, it's not all the shamanic context. And this is the part that's been globalized legally. There's some parts of the world that's it's, there's quasi legal and 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 a certain level of tolerance that's uh, in different European countries, but uh, we now have four churches in Canada, and one of them has organized their first uh, conference, which is in October, uh, ayahuasca and religion, and I'll be presenting there, and uh, a few of us, including Sarah, will be there. So if you're interested in that. I can give you the information. So the next slide um, talks a little bit here about Takiwasi, and I mentioned it. It's the site of a research project that I've been leading for a while. And what makes it unique is um, unique in the sense it's in Peru. Uh, it's it's an accredited um, addiction treatment facility uh, founded by Jacques Mabit, and it's been operating around 25 years, a little bit longer now. Um, with quote-unquote integration of uh, traditional medicine, including ayahuasca, tobacco, lots of other um, plant medicine, and uh, psychotherapy, um, psychology, testing, um, rehabilitation therapy for work, et cetera, et cetera. It's a nine-month program. So many of the retreat centers that you might have heard about or even been to, they are now moving towards providing integration. They may have psychologists, they may have um, uh, yoga, et cetera, et cetera. But Takiwasi still stands out as an accredited addiction treatment center by the government of Peru. And it, it's where we, I offered my services for research because it has the infrastructure to do that. And the focus is completely on addictions. I can talk a little bit more about Takiwasi or just, uh, uh, allude a little bit more to our project, but I didn't want to make the focus of the talk. Next one, please. So this was uh, as of August 30, 2018, the IATRIP advisor, um, which by the way, I went on the site today to catch up and it, it wasn't there anymore, so maybe it's been replaced or maybe the CAMH uh, server kind of blocked it out or something, I'm not sure. Uh, but you can see at this point 116 ayahuasca centers and then lots of other options including Yopo and Cambo, Niboga, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not so hard. In fact, I saw a, a promotional uh, information piece here. So it's, it's not hard to find. And we can talk a bit about pros and cons of this kind of experience. <clears throat> and many of you also know that there are different places in I, I, not all countries, but many countries where you can experience uh, the shamanic process with ayahuasca. So it has clearly been globalized. Next slide. So what's the evidence base? I focus here a little bit on addiction because that's been my focus for our project. And, uh, but the evidence is really, really growing quickly around depression, PTSD. It's a recent paper on eating disorders and so on. So I, I'm not here to give you the full, full picture, but to really make the point that, quote unquote, something is going on here. Um, I am, at the end of the day, a research scientist and uh, uh, pretty objective in my work, I must say. And I wouldn't be here if I didn't think there was 
a story here that was not worth telling from a scientific point of view. Um, you can imagine we, have, we now have policymakers in Health Canada uh, who are thinking about this. Uh, they certainly have all the media information. Uh, they've seen a lot on TV. They have anxieties. Um, but then they also, I think we're blessed in this country with relatively open mind. We have legalized cannabis, for example. And in, in BC, which in some ways leads the pack, uh, there's now discussion about legalized um, psilocybin, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> research is important. Uh, and it's also important because research identifies risk. And there are risks here. Uh, and we have a process. Uh, there's challenges with it, but we have a process of how we gather, um, quote unquote, research information that then contributes to policy, which then contributes to funding, which then makes this really more available. Until the research is done and uh, convincing, or convincing enough, uh, then this will all will remain underground and people will be heading off to private retreats or down to the Amazon. It's, this is largely my motivation, because I felt um, equipped to provide this evidence or at least contribute to it, which also includes supporting students who are interested in this work. And uh, by the way, I'm not a clinician. I'm a PhD uh, researcher, so thank you for the doctor. Uh, <clears throat> but the only person I ever counseled is myself in the mirror. <clears throat> or I, I, I tried with my children, but I haven't gone very well. So next one, and, and I won't give you a big long list, but, uh, and I didn't want too many slides just with a lot of bullet points to make it lecture-like. But this is probably the largest compilation, but you see already it's 2014. Uh, that book is still available, but a lot has happened since. I guess kind of, if I was to sum things up, we have tremendous anecdotal evidence from indigenous people in Brazil and Peru and Ecuador, et cetera, and tremendous anecdotal evidence from the Brazilian churches that it is helpful and it, that it's helpful for addictions. People, people go, there's kind of like common knowledge that if you're dealing with addictions, then this is helpful. There's something kind of contrary or antithetical about this medicine and alcohol and, and other substances. It's, it's just that doesn't work together. So you can come out of uh, an experience and just there's, there's a reduction in craving almost immediate. And uh, interestingly, this can stay for quite some time. So we have all that anecdotal evidence. We also have how many thousands, we don't know how many thousands, but there are thousands of people who now have had this experience. And they wouldn't still be going if it wasn't helping. Like, it's just common sense, <laughs> right? It's been going on long enough. If people were dying and people were not getting anything out of it, it would have stopped by now. Uh, it's been going on, especially the way it's escalated over the last years. If you call it ayahuasca tourism, whatever you want to call it. And people go for many reasons, and a lot of them are going for healing, and a lot of them are going back. Um, a lot also are going just to explore a curiosity and looking for something bigger than themselves, which is the spiritual aspect I'll touch on shortly. The Brazilian studies, we show long-term use has zero addictive potential. This is one of the major risks for, uh, in the minds of policymakers. Like, are we just replacing drug for drug is the kind of the, the simple way of putting that. And that logic still pervades a lot of the resistance to harm reduction work, by the way. But we're not trading drug for drug, we're trading drug for medicine. It's a different kind of story. And, but it takes research, it takes that evidence to say, well, yeah, I drank ayahuasca like 30 times in the last 40 days, and uh, I'm still standing, and I don't really need it tomorrow. And so it doesn't build up craving. There's no uh, very little evidence, if any, of addictive potential. That's a very, very important uh, fact. Um, then we have a lot of retrospective research. People asked to recall back their experiences, and they had an alcohol or drug problem or depression and now they're feeling better. That's kind of like low grade evidence, but it's helpful. And then we have more prospective studies that uh, 
people who initiate an experience like at Takiwasi or one of the treatment centers, uh, retreat centers, um, uh, stop or or change dramatically their their mood, and we heard some of these stories today, or it plants a seed that leads to change. And I really want to emphasize the points that both Debbie and Matt made about the work is still to be done. This medicine will show you consequences. It'll show you what needs to be done, uh, and then it's up to you. That's true with any uh, any therapy, any medication, whatever. It's still left up to you. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll mention a little bit about our our project. The next slide maybe comes up. No, so back to Debbie's point. The doctor will tell us how this works. You could summarize things kind of in three um, potential mechanisms. And in reality, I think they're all working at the same time and we don't, we don't really have the answer um, as to how this is all working. Here I'm speaking specifically around ayahuasca, although there's a lot of similarity across the psychedelics. By the way, MDMA is not technically a psychedelic, doesn't have the same biochemistry effects, but it's often used in now in psychedelic therapy, so just kind of blend it together, but it does have different kind of neurochemistry. And I'm not an expert in the neurochemistry. Every time I read about that, I still pause and have to go talk to somebody <clears throat> because it is, it is complicated. And I think the, the, the reality is it's, it's affecting a lot of different mechanisms at the same time. The brain is so incredibly complicated, billions and billions of connections. And how it's working will probably remain a mystery for generations if we last that long. Um, the best way I can describe it, the best way it's been described to me or when I read about it, is the term psychointegration. So we used to think back in the day that our functions, thought, speech, memory, etc., were kind of located in different connections, different parts of the brain. It's not different parts of the brain, it's different networks of the brain. So our brain is networked and these networks kind of work together and and they have boundaries around them so we don't see and smell the number nine. I like that one, right? So we kind of see, but we're not smelling the seeing. So there's boundaries around these things. So it means there's also boundaries around memory. There's boundaries around your emotional regulation. And uh, I think these medicines, the way they're working, the neurochemistry is, is um, uh, creating more permeable boundaries. They're creating connectivity across areas of the brain which are bounded and protected. And this is Gabor's thinking that a lot of that pain has been basically protected and, and hidden away. So that's, in a nutshell, I think what's happening in uh, neurochemistry, at least that's, that's kind of a helpful way for me. The other are psychological. By the way, many people say it all kind of comes down to the neuroscience at the end of the day. I don't know if I go there necessarily. At the end of the day, the brain is kind of organizing everything. But I don't think it's helpful necessarily from a therapeutic point of view to, to, to put all of our money, all of our investment into the neuroscience because at the end of the day, people still have to talk about their experience and, and express things. So we do need kind of psychological interpretations. But I, I also think they're helpful. And we do have this thing about um, a released emotion or uh, feeling of love or you know everything that you've heard today I don't need to repeat in the in the um, in the film and then lastly I will come back to it it's so common the senses in the literature is called mystical experience or peak experience or or sense of connectivity and again you saw it really well displayed in the film and also in the stories a sense and you don't have to call it God even. There's is a very interesting publication recently that describes the God experience across DMT, um, LSD, and uh, magic mushrooms, and ayahuasca. And they all share this experience. And uh, it was so interesting in this article. If you just Googled God experience hallucinogens, it'll probably come up. And um, the, the experience with ayahuasca seems to be the most sustainable. That was such such an interesting thing to read. And this was based on several thousand people uh, with these experiences, none of whom had experienced the other. So they found people who had only had that, used that particular um, substance. So this is a very common experience and underlies a lot of uh, uh, the benefit when people say, shit, I'm not alone. 
or we are all connected. And uh, Debbie expressed it beautifully, that DMT experience, of, uh, which is a serious rocket ship, by the way, right? And um, <clears throat> um, the uh, sense of that we're, this is light that we all share, this vibration that we all share. By the way, I am a Kundalini Yoga teacher, and there's so much similarity in the language of, of Kundalini Yoga and uh, vibration and sound and so on. You might want to read a little bit about that yourself. So let's go on quickly. I'm taking up too much time, I think. So why is this important is a good question. I was asked that question a couple days ago because I've been organizing, working hard to have a national uh, conference here in Toronto uh, on psychedelics and sponsored by CAMH or whoever wants to step up to do that. And we do seem to have support from some major uh, national organizations. Uh, but still kind of in the works, so I'm having this conversation with my colleagues at CAMH and somebody from public affairs, somebody, you know, interested in kind of public opinion. So why is this important? And there's fundamentally two reasons, I think. One is we have a huge treatment gap, and that is the level of need is in no way, shape, or form being met by the current supply of service. Separate from quality, <laughs> just waiting times and access to services. And this is a 10 times greater in countries other than Canada. So we have a gap in our capacity to respond. And secondly, uh, we have services that don't help everybody. It's a mistake to say that addictions treatment doesn't work or treatment for depression doesn't work. It works for some, uh, but for some people it doesn't work and we don't know what the hell to do. And, and, I, and I really appreciate it in the film and in the stories you heard, the sense of, of desperation. And you, and you really should try to put yourself in those boots. Um, what it's like just to never feel normal. And uh, there but for the grace of God, go I, right? There but for the grace of God, go I. In fact, I was, I've had, I, in my work I do a lot of discussion, focus groups, direct contact and conversation with people who've lived and living experience. And, and I asked somebody, the people was using this thing about, well, self-medication, self-medication. I said, what does that actually mean to you? Because in research, we tend to think it's like, if all of I have these symptoms, I'll choose that substance. Okay, like crystal meth will be for that, cocaine will be for that, alcohol will be for that. And they said, no, 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 no. We, we self-medicate to get out of ourselves. We self-medicate just to be normal for a moment, to not be in pain. And that's, that's a good way to look at self-medication. So we have this system that's hard to find services. And um, what, there's some people just who are not getting the help that they need. So the context, you can read this here, but we, I think the most important point here is there is a resurgence in the interest in psychedelic medicine broadly, and ayahuasca is part of that, MDMA is part of that. And I will speak in a moment about where does ayahuasca fit in this story, because it's got kind of an uneasy relationship at the moment. There's also a real resurgence, at least in the Western world, around the potential for neuro neuroscience to solve our problems. Folks who do this kind of work really do believe there will be a, a magic answer at some point. You know, maybe we found it, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, so the neuroscience model is kind of current as opposed to 20 years ago, 30 years ago with psychoanalysis, gone through different forms of psychology. But uh, the more we've learned about the brain, the brain imaging, Okay, the, the answer's got to be in here somewhere. So psychedelics, part of the resurgence is related to this interest in the neuroscience because it's extremely fascinating and, and of interest to a lot of really important neuroscientists around the world. And the publications are getting better and better and in much higher quality journals. And this also helps with the kind of the credibility. So it's one thing to publish in the journal of psychedelic da 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 but it's another thing to publish in World Psychiatry, which is the number one psychiatry ranked journal in the world. So these things really make a difference in the point of view of policy. 
there's also another interesting point at the bottom here around the World Health Organization coming out openly and big publications now in the second edition uh, renewal of, of kind of a strategy in support of traditional and complementary medicine and and also the UN declaring indigenous medicine is real and needs to be supported uh, and and this opens the door then to import and bring in uh, different kinds of approaches into Western society and people say you can't say no with the current kind of debate is is it for indigenous people or not um, we can touch on that but uh, there's a lot of factors behind kind of the resurgence and why it's important and that this relays a little bit of it next slide um, I like this one because this is a reality in many countries um, if you go to South Africa you go to many parts of Africa or South America even here in Toronto people have traditional healers people go they're, they're using traditional healing and using complementary medicine uh, and and in many parts of the world this treatment gap is so huge that why wouldn't we support this and why wouldn't we import the knowledge from these cultures and bring it here so next slide this is a really interesting slide because we used to think of substance abuse along a continuum from low risk to harm and I've had that mantra I've been supporting that mantra for 20 30 40 years of my career but what we see on the right hand left hand side here are the beneficial effects or the beneficial aspects of substance use this is a sanctioned government policy in British Columbia and this is a major breakthrough in our thinking about uh, the use of uh, psychedelic substances psychoactive substances for healing that there actually are benefits and it also recognizes the ceremonial use of tobacco in our First Nations so it's very cool this was a major breakthrough okay next um, I've been fortunate and um, honored to be leading an ayahuasca uh, research project at Takiwasi and another site potentially in uh, Mexico and I think the next is a shout out to our crowd funders. It was kind of out of the gate pretty early back in uh, 2000, I think 13 or something. We got started, we raised $40,000. And from a researcher point of view, I have to tell you how humbling it was, um, uh, how interesting it was to be part of the crowdfunding, like a big part of it. And Gabor offered his time. People may not even know about this anymore, but it was kind of a big thing at the, well, at the moment. Um, somebody send you five bucks and say I can't send any more but thank you because nothing is helping me <clears throat> or somebody say I can't actually send you anything but is there anything I can do it showed me the level of desperation and I can tell you I feel more obligated to these 400 it was actually 450 at the end I feel more obligated to them than to any government agency that's ever given me a two million dollar grant another shout out to those guys um, I think it was really interesting in the in the um, the film uh, very dramatic demonstration of the importance of set and setting so the psychological mindset the preparation the creation of an intention and also the experience of the user which is also reflected in your story Debbie as you get more experience you can learn how to work with her um, but also the setting, the difference in experience at night versus day, in a group versus, you know, um, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, which we wouldn't necessarily see with ayahuasca. But this also makes it extremely hard to study. Uh, it's not like you're studying the substance ayahuasca, you're, su you're studying the substance in a context that's changing all the time, and even the substance itself is not standardized, so it's very hard to pin down exactly what the active ingredients are. So if somebody says, um, it really helped me, and you say, what was it? It's pretty hard, isn't it, to pin down the ingredient within that. But our reductionist mind in science wants to say, well, we want to kind of parcel that out. And you can only get it by stories. You can't really organize a research design to do that. By the way, it's kind of hard to do a placebo study 
with ayahuasca, it's pretty clear. <laughs> to, to, to me, it's pretty clear. They're, they're trying in, in Mexico to make this work. I don't know what they're giving them. <laughs> um, but anyway, so a little bit, and I'll, I'll close off shortly. So what does the future hold? Like I, I ask this question all the time, like I'm helping on this project. We're now into it three to four years. We're doing a prospective follow-up, lots of interviews, lots of kind of quantitative, like it's a really bona fide day. We will be publishing this uh, in a year or so. We now have 30 people at a one-year follow-up, and we've got about 30, no, sorry, 20 or so at a, almost at a two-year period. So just the, the quality of the research. And these are people really, really dealing with heavy addiction. So. Um, we're just now starting, we got 30, we can start with the analysis. But then I asked myself this question and I listen to, to the personal stories and then I think about this event and, and the interesting kind of moving all of this towards more open use of, of these medicines. Where is all this going and where in particular is it going for research and what are the barriers besides just getting the research done. Um, I don't know exactly what the end game is, but there's a couple questions here. Who, who will actually be qualified? Who will be deemed to be qualified to be the facilitators, to be the therapist, or whatever you want to call them? Um, and if we're talking about ayahuasca, because if we're talking about psilocybin, we're talking about MDMA, we're talking about LSD, there's there's a capsule here. There's an analysis of this substance that makes policymakers happy, that they know exactly what that is, they can control the dosage, they control the length of the experience, et cetera, generally. Um, and, and so there's training programs to be a MAPS, MAPS uh, uh, psychedelic therapist, there's training programs. Now you can go, be, go to California, be trained, there are friends of mine who are there right now. And uh, they will be therapists. There's also therapists um, here and, and uh, working. Um, and, and they have an experience, and it's in a controlled setting with uh, music that's been programmed. And the old model was put, put the mask on. And what you saw with, with the young girl is kind of a, a very controlled situation. Ayahuasca scares the shit out of people, not just the people who are drinking it. <coughs> You know, the, the, the shamanic context introduces a whole new realm of considerations. Like, is it like hocus pocus? Is it, is it like, who's the shaman guy or woman, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the discussion of therapeutic competence right now is largely leaving out the shamanic context. It's really important that you think about that because many people are seeking out that option because it's giving them something um, that the other experiences are not. And I'm convinced that we can have all the psychotherapists in the world um, practicing good psychedelic medicine and people will still be going to Peru. People will still be going to Ecuador and Colombia and Venezuela, et cetera, et cetera. And people will still be going to ceremony where they can find it because they're getting something there that they're not getting there still will be people who are not getting what they need. So who will be qualified? And then uh, this other question is kind of under what kind of um, pretext in a way, what kind of context will we kind of maneuver ayahuasca into the picture? Um, it, will it be kind of part of the psychedelic medicine movement? It kind of is now, but it isn't because of some of these concerns I raised. Will it come in under kind of traditional complementary medicine, which already has kind of a, a foothold? Think about where acupuncture was 20, 30 years ago. I mean, it was like an alternative medicine. Well, it's here now. People are trained therapists, et cetera, et cetera. So it's one to keep in mind of that shift from complementary to, to alternative and complementary medicine basically means bringing a healing practice from somewhere else here to, to a new culture. So it's now alternative and complementary but then it becomes the norm. Acupuncture, I think, is a, is a really good example. And lastly, I think a huge question, where will spirituality fit into the mix? 
because it is a profound experience and it does underlie an awful lot of people's perceived benefit. It is a tremendously powerful experience and it can be experienced without psychedelics, by the way. It can be experienced, some people are yogis or Buddhists, they've had this experience just by thinking about it <laughs> and practicing mental discipline and physical discipline. Uh, you can have this experience in nature uh, and so on. But there seems to be something about, on psychedelics and ayahuasca in particular, that breaks down some of the barriers to things and, and energies and so on that we can't see normally or we're trained not to see anymore. Uh, although maybe as children that's what we're seeing. I think all children uh, have a spiritual heart and it's kind of like taken out of them in some way rather than put into them later as adults. So where will spirituality fit into this mix? Maybe another slide. Um, this was uh, a credit to um, Alex, uh, Sarah's um, primary th supervisor for her thesis um, on sending me a link to this, uh, this article, which was about kind of the dialectic, the tension between uh, the way it was framed in these days, religion and, and um, <coughs> science. And uh, so I think of more as science and spirituality. And there's really kind of four ways to look at this. And I would like you to go home actually thinking a little bit about where you stand <coughs> or when you're in conversations about spirituality, think about where you sit in relation to the person that you're talking about. So one relationship is basically antagonism. And I think this is best represented by there's creationists and there's scientists. There's people who believe in evolution and there's people who believe in creationism and they just don't they just set out to prove each other wrong. It's not about even having a dialogue. So some people think that way about science and spirituality. It's just like never the twain will meet or should meet because they just see things so diametrically opposed to each other and they, and they fight hard to hold their position. The second is kind of a interdependence where each has kind of a separate sphere of, of uh, expertise but they kind of maintain a kind of a polite distance from each other. The third is dialogue where we recognize there are areas of common concern and we'll at least talk about it. And the fourth is kind of integration and I think this is where we would all like to see um, spiritual practice in the healthcare system uh, including mental health and addictions and really recognizing the role of, of spirituality, and there's many ways to define that. I don't mean religion, I know you know that. Um, but where would it fit and how can we incorporate it into our, into our healing in Western medicine is one way of putting it. Or will it sit in one of these other ways? So not only do you need to think about it personally, but we need policymakers thinking about their stance. We need um, researchers thinking about their stance uh, and we need therapists thinking about their stance. This is an important slide. Um, the next couple slides show that there's a lot of movement already underway in palliative care and, and, and uh, in service of, of uh, people who are dying or um, perhaps going to be dying. We have past, quote unquote pastoral care um, it's part of our healthcare system. Every hospital I know has a chapel, and uh, there's a chaplain, and there's people who are trained and charged with providing spiritual care in the healthcare system. It, it is integrated. And you'll be amazed at how much evidence there is around it and how many research articles, et cetera, et cetera, there is. So in this world of healthcare, not necessarily our mental health addictions world, it's arrived in a way it's close to that integration uh, category. The next one are our First Nations friends. And um, they've been doing this for a long time. In fact, our North American friends, they have all their own medicines. Uh, it's interesting how tobacco is so common across. It's, that's an interesting one to think about. It's, it's, uh, it's the main spirit plant 
in all indigenous cultures that we know about, actually. I don't know how that happened. <coughs> but um, we have sweat lodge, we have smudge ceremony, uh, we have elders, we have medicines. And CAMH, I'm proud to say, has a sweat lodge. Uh, CAMH has an indigenous healing department. And uh, it is referred to in the CAMH literature as an evidence-based practice. I'm pretty proud of that, actually. And you can go to many, many um, communities that have alcohol and drug services funded through Health Canada or elsewhere, and almost all of them now will have uh, uh, some aspect of culture built in. Stories, uh, elders who come in, uh, pipe ceremony, smudging, a um, sweat lodge, and so on. But it's moving into the mainstream. Uh, Elders are now being paid, not everywhere, but they're being paid as a, as a service delivery agent. So we've, we've kind of opened the door here. There's a crack in the, in the, in the wall in the Leonard Cohen sense of this may be where the light comes in. Um, so it's important to keep this in mind. Next slide and I'm almost finished. Um, going beyond addiction, I think I've spoken mostly about addictions, but I want to acknowledge the work underway in PTSD and I have many colleagues who focus on PTSD and I work at drawing their attention to this work and so far they've been open to at least listening to me. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Again, in relation to the need, it's like, um, it's, it's a difficult challenge. There's a lot of work to do. But the evidence is accumulating. The next one is around bereavement and end of life, which is uh, Sarah's subject of interest. And uh, I th this was part of the psychedelic research movement back in the, in the day, 60s, and in, into the point where it was kind of shut down. It was not only work about mental health and addictions. Uh, a lot of the work was around end of life. And if you think about it, we're all going there. <laughs> uh, could it be any more relevant, actually, in terms of the needs of the population to have a good death and uh, to be able to say you're sorry, uh, to be able to accept that you did shit and, and you acknowledge what you did, or to be able, there's, there's been a project in Brazil, the current government shut it down, but uh, using ayahuasca kind of in the Santa Daime context in um, uh, the most notorious prison in Brazil, dealing with some pretty bad guys. and. Uh, um, how do you feel when the person that you've murdered comes to tell you that it's okay? That they forgive you? Can you imagine the healing and for you to say you're sorry and for them to say that's okay? That's powerful stuff. So the ability of these medicines to pave the way for a good death is extremely powerful. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see why it's important. Because we're all going there. And we should all hope for a good death. Next slide, and then I think I am done. Uh, really out of the box. Let's go really out of the box. Next slide. What uh, balance of effort do we put into prevention compared to treatment? We've spent the whole night talking about treatment. And the real need is around prevention, isn't it? Absolutely, and this is really demonstrating how out of whack uh, not only our resources, but also our evidence. What do we really um, can do? And the next slide is a bit of an eye-opener because in <clears throat> these indigenous communities, um, it's used as prevention. Um, uh, the gentleman here, I'll speak to him in a moment, is uh, a brother of a good friend of mine uh, Mapu and and they started drinking ayahuasca when they were 12 years old with their father, and uh, it, and it's common in their community as a way of um, a learning to walk softly on the earth because you take care of the plants, take care of the forest, and also take care of your neighbors. It creates communion and uh, community. And um, there's some research. Uh, um, I think his first name is Jake Walsh in BC has done some work with. Um, national survey data showing that uh, use of psychedelics in adolescents might actually be preventive 
for future substance abuse. It's pretty interesting work. So I think this is kind of getting out of the box, open your eyes to the, to the preventive potential of these medicines. Last slide and then I am finished. I wanted to close by offering a dedication to the First Nations people who've walked here before. And there's more than one of those communities. I also wanted to give a dedication to our first responders and our veterans and our police officers and our firefighters <laughs> who give and who have given so much. It's not lost on me that it's 9-11 uh, today. And um, <clears throat> I'm honored to be here with you. And lastly, there's a bit of a shout out to our Amazonian friends and family because this is where this medicine comes from and it's under attack in many ways. And uh, the next slide shows um, uh, some friends of mine and what they've just experienced in their community being burned. And, uh, and the need is very high. So the media has already stopped talking about it, if you notice. <laughs> but fires, all right? There's 80,000 of them, 80,000 of them burning in the Amazon. And this was just one that touched people that I know. And I put a, we have a fundraiser that I'll just mention. I think I put the, the link and I'm happy to send it to anybody. Next slide, please. It's a go-to go fundraiser for Mapu and his community. And I think I'm done. Next slide. Good luck in your personal and professional work. Thank you.